Bonsoir. How are you, dear friends? We are building the most inspiring and phenomenal communities of wine lovers. As we all know, wine is the catalyst of the greatest discussion. We'll be talking wine, but of course food, and everything that touches all our nation and senses. Bonjour, bonsoir, dear friends. Bienvenue, JCB Live. Happy hour in person. Why? It's very simple. She's irresistible. She's so attractive that I could not even fathom imagining talking to her via a screen. She has beautiful curly red hair, a lot of brain. She was a security lawyer, big time. You're talking Wall Street and the big of the big but she made an important decision. I want to be in Northern California in Marin County. I want to be close to the farm, close to the products. I want to be close to where things are crafted. I want to be close to the future of slow food. She managed it and she created Edible Magazine. A fantastic marketplace as well. She will tell us all about it. Her name is Gibson Thomas. Ladies and gentlemen, she's not really available, but as you know me now, you may have a chance if you want to meet her on a personal basis. She's fantastic. She owns this magazine. She's a trendsetter, and she's going to tell us all about what's happening in the world of food, wine, and more. Gibson, if the sound of those bubbles makes you come. Uh, oh, yes! Gibson, would you be giving us the honor of your privileged presence. Jean Charles, I feel like I should just take a quick exit after that introduction. I'm not sure I can live up to that, but I'll try. Ooh la la, you live <laughs> up to that and more. Gibson, may we... Merci. This is the new way of saying hello in the social distancing word of Napa Valley. We do cheers. Amen, amen. Welcome, welcome. Okay, may I take a sip? Absolutely. I was waiting because I was intimidated for a second. Did you see? I just... Mmm. 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 Ah. What do you feel? Like perfect, creamy little bubbles. Really fabulous. Ah. Happy Friday, indeed. Well, well, and Gibson, this is for you, originally born in the South. Indeed. How exciting. <laughs> the South of America, for me as a Frenchman, really represents the foundation, a great place, amazing people, and you have the hair of Tara from Gone with the Wind. Oh my, wow. Ooh la la. That's high cotton, as we say, in the South, to be compared to Vivian Lee. Um, yes, uh, I grew up in the South, and as Dan Barber from um, Blue Hill and Stone Barns in New York says, really, Southern food is the only indigenous food culture in the United States, and I really am grateful to have grown up uh, in steeped in that food culture. I had a Ooh. grandmother that was really a, an amazing entertainer. She was kind of the hostess of her town in northern Alabama and uh, we called her Sweet Thing. That Ooh. was my nickname for her. But of course. And I really learned um, at, at her um, side to appreciate good food and really the power of bringing people together mm. around a table. Was she a major inspiration? in Absolutely. the world you now evolved into you know my my aunt uh, my mother's sister always says that sweet thing just she's hopefully watching me from afar and can't believe that i ended up in this world and i still make her pickles every year and she used to take us to the farm pick out our the peaches we would get you know bring home bushels of fresh shrimp when we would go to the beach every year and put them up wow. and it was just my mother didn't cook and if she sees this she'll be really irritated that I put that out there but I think she what did, it gave you the opportunity to be the one it did and I I, I will say I, I wrote about it a few years ago when my mother was born in 1945 
there was a movement in her generation to get women out of the kitchen. And I definitely had the, you know, rice a and hamburger helper and those awful TV dinners, which I think in France you were probably spared. I hope I so. think we were. <laughs> Campbell's but it food. sounds fun though. But it felt it was a very liberating movement for women not to be tied to the kitchen. For sure. They could work outside the home and they had these, you know, fast foods. I remember McDonald's being sort of a treat. But now the luxury is to be able to cook. Like my idea of just the height of of a wonderful day is to go to the market to shop to cook for friends and then to sit down at the table and so it was sort of the the backlash um the women wanted out of the kitchen and now men and women are dying to get back and are they getting the back in the kitchen you think well i will say that covid has certainly driven them back into the kitchen and that's it, maybe the positive side it is a silver lining absolutely And one of the my longtime partners in the magazine um, is Central Milling and Keith Justo Baking Supply up in Petaluma. And of course, people were, you know, lining up outside their door, the new interest in baking bread. And there was a yeast shortage. There was a flour shortage. And I think it's it's really emboldened people to try new things. I, I've always entertained a lot and people will say I can't believe you try new recipes yes and I say well I just always invite nice people to my house and if it's a disaster we'll throw <laughs> it out and we'll order out at the last minute but it's minute, great to be daring and audacious in front of your friends it is and, and rather than just doing the same old recipe because you know you master it well exactly and I I, I don't bake because baking um, is a different animal. I think cooking, you can fix it at the end. You can add a little something to it and make it taste good. But baking is more difficult. You have to be more exact mm -hmm. um, with that and you have to pay attention. And I, I like to drink my wine while I'm cooking. Oh, you do cook <laughs> and drink wine. Absolutely. I love it. So we brought for you a wine from the old world because you love the old world you and you will tonight dive into history and the heritage of food. So this is one of the oldest house making sparkling wine in Burgundy, mm. founded in 1877. Wow. And this is for you a Pinot Noir because it's centrality. And it's, it's gorgeous. We knew it would match your hair. <laughs> Almost. It's not really pink, folks. It's <laughs> I, I it's have taken to have to do my own hair during COVID, but <laughs> oh, they look great. <laughs> Thank you. So, in terms of your passion, how did you discover that food was going to be something you would want to do? Because you had different phases in your life: big, obviously, security lawyer. I mean, big time, and then you decided, I want to follow my passion, right? Yes. Um, But how did you discover first what was your passion? Well, I, I mean, I always loved, I had one friend in college when I would cook for friends and her mother said, oh my goodness, don't tell people that you know how to cook or you'll have to. And I said, but, but I love to. And it's, to me, it's a very, like it's a Zen practice. Yes. It really is my therapy to get into the kitchen, but I get it that some people don't like it at all, but I was a political science Spanish major mm -hmm. in college. And what do you do with that? You go on to graduate school. <laughs> you, can, you either teach or you go on to graduate school or you sell something. So I had grown up pretty involved in politics that my family was involved in in the South and I'd spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. and sort of pictured myself as a lobbyist or mm -hmm. somehow in law. So I went to law school, and by the time I got to law school, um, I had figured out how to study and how to manage my time, and I went to Vanderbilt in Nashville, which is a fabulous town, and lots of live music and great restaurants, and had a wonderful three years in law school. Uh, graduated and went to work for the Olympic Committee oh. in Atlanta. Um, I was a lawyer for their marketing arm and then my first husband and I, who was also a lawyer, we moved to Washington, D.C. Two lawyers together, that never It really was works. rough. It was really rough. He was also a securities lawyer. Ooh. 
But I went with him to Washington, D.C., and when I got there, I decided that maybe I wouldn't practice law. A friend of mine had just left her job in D.C., moved back to Atlanta. She was running a small catering company, mm. very high-end dinner parties. I had never even been a waitress. I had no idea what it really took to be in the food industry. But she encouraged me to go talk to the couple who owned this business, so I did. And I started out planning small dinner parties oh. for them, very high end in Washington, D.C., a lot of diplomats, a lot of work for American University. But then what do you do when your chef, when your cook yeah. doesn't show up? You get in the kitchen and you start cooking on those days. So, but it was hard work. I would get home and my husband would be like, oh, you smell. It would be like food head to toe. I would have started at the market. So I did that for but a couple of years. But it's quite appetizing. <laughs> I find it pretty cool. Perhaps. <laughs> I'll drink to that. I will bite you. <laughs> I won't say more because it wouldn't be too proper. <laughs> we have to keep this PC. Keep it G-rated. Um, <laughs> so then after two years in Washington, D.C., we decided to move back to Atlanta. And I really knew then that I either would had to go and practice law then or yes. kind of lose the opportunity. So I did a bit the bullet, uh, found a job at a law firm and practice business mm. and securities law. I see. But I, I really had the, the best of all worlds of being a lawyer. I feel like my, my firm handled a lot of family businesses and we did everything from them, from estate planning, tax planning, business mm. work and I was doing a lot of work for one very wealthy family and when I decided to move to California 22 years ago this summer um, congratulations thank you it's it's been quite an adventure I just I can't imagine what my life would um, have been like if I had stayed in the south and really I decided I, I decided being married to a lawyer was not going to work for me anymore and that so was So you made a decision. Yes, and that was the catalyst um, leave Atlanta be, become single again. I was uh, 30 and I was either going to move to New York or to San Francisco. I had only been to San Francisco one time. But I really decided that I knew too many people in New York and I wanted to just totally Start change again. my paradigm. So I moved out here with the thought that if I didn't love it, I would move back. And I have not looked back since. Um, I first landed in San Francisco and my client at my firm in Atlanta had asked me to be their in-house counsel. Mm. Um, funny thing, one of their holdings, they had owned two NASCAR teams oh. and I became the NASCAR expert. My son and I watched the movie Rush last night and I had to tell him I was not an F1 lawyer, but I was a NASCAR lawyer. But I came up here yeah. and went to, when during one of the races. That's the Sonoma Racetrack. The Sonoma Racetrack, which has got such a great history here in the middle of wine country you have yeah. this um racetrack but literally the first time i came to california my first stop was oakville grocery oh. friends picked us up at the airport they brought us out here we got a picnic at oakville grocery we went up into one of the vineyards and has it and i really think that just made such an impression yeah upon me that i i just felt really drawn drawn to live here. They were my yeah. kind of people. Um, and I have to say, when I was leaving Atlanta and friends said, oh, don't move to California, you'll never find, you know, another husband, which of course would be the goal. And they said, and you've got earthquakes and all the men are gay. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I grew up with hurricanes and tornadoes yes. and every, knock on wood. I uh, haven't had a major earthquake since I've been here. And happily found um, plenty of men out here. <laughs> oh good, well let's have another yeah, toast to that. to that. So it's still possible ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Whatever you look for in California you can find. Exactly, it is the land of opportunity. Um, but I read, I was in the city for... You know we're supposed to, to, to drink to because it's seven years of, of bad food otherwise or, oh, or bad something. Yeah, bad I'm not food. sure what it is. Mm. There's only one person here who knows what it is, it's Dylan, but he's behind the camera. So Dylan, we don't curse us. Yes. 
This is so delicious. Do you like the style? I really do. It's the the bubbles are so tiny. There's not like it's had a great nose, but there's no like sometimes if you are drinking sparkling champagne, it can be sort of bitey and mm -hmm. this is really really great dosage it's and it's burgundy pinot so we are 250 kilometers south of champagne mm -hmm. so it's a little richer a little more sunshine a little riper mm -hmm. and you don't need any pinot meunier for it so it's a hundred percent the same dosage that the house has been doing for mm -hmm. over 140 years and can people purchase this here yes. through you. Uh, always, of okay, course. Okay, wonderful. Well, we want to be the purveyor of the finest wines to everyone in the world. Sure, if but your family can. in France is not involved. Totally, in so we make it in Burgundy. Ah. So we own it, we make it in Burgundy, the small town of Nuit Saint-Georges, mm. and this is all about us. And in fact, a good friend of yours, and we want to say hello to Gary Danko, because yes. he's the reason why Believe it or not, in 2001, so almost 20 years ago, I received a phone call, I was in Burgundy, and Gary Danko restaurant, we'd love to order Louis Bouillot, and we were not in the United States, and he had oh. tasted it in France, loved it, brought back the label, found the person who owned it, and here I am on the other line. Wow. And that was the beginning when I came back to San Francisco, friendship with Gary. And they so became, you were not here then? I was not here then. Oh. Yeah, How long have you been here? Well, many years back and forth, but mm -hmm. really over the last seven, eight years now, since 2007, mm. back really full time. You know, I met you at the Tyler Florence shop. That's right. Downtown Mill Valley. And we met as well with uh, Michael Pollan. Exactly. In San Francisco, the man who wrote many phenomenal books, but that night he was talking about the omnivore dilemma yes. and the secret life of plants yes that was a great night yes he actually um he spoke at the 10th anniversary of the good food awards in january um and he was speaking to the good food awards and you guys are supporters of yes. the good food awards and small producers all over the country we're about in two weeks we'll judge remotely this year sure. unfortunately um i'm judging snacks this year um and but he spoke at the 10th anniversary of the good food awards and he was speaking to the artisan producers and he said there which has become a dirty word become a virus um that mm -hmm. he's talking about the small producer when you grow large or when you get purchased by a larger food company because organic sustainable food is really the sector of the food market that is growing exponentially and big food knows that so they're buying up these small artisan producers and he said you can either become an ornament yes for the big company in their portfolio or you can infect the whole company with your values and That's don't right. forget why it is you're doing what you're doing and i was sitting next to helen russell who is the co-founder and ceo of equator coffees and teas that's right my dear friend that that's the only um coffee that thomas keller uses in any of his restaurants and uh, listening to it all i could think was i want to reprint this in the magazine so i was in the lobby after the awards and i found michael and i told him what I wanted to do and he reached into his pocket and Michael Pollan handed me his speech this you know world famous author award winning author so it's reprinted in this issue of the magazine which you can find it in print or online on our website and I love it because we have a similar story when we saw each other in the city of San Francisco for mm -hmm. that big I asked the same thing and Michael and he handed me the speech as oh, well. Oh, wonderful. So we share that in common. We should, well, we'll make sure we send that to Michael as well if he's not watching. Mm -hmm. So, Gibson, let's go into furthering your life because, you know, all our viewers are very excited about seeing a woman who quits the big corporate world <laughs> after great success, moves to California by herself, restructure her life, and follows a passion. So how do you follow in life your passion? Give us give us the clues of doing this because you started this amazing magazine and you followed the inspiration, I assume, of your grandmothers in many ways. I did. Um, the magazine, that is our 11th anniversary issue. 
Um, when I, the summer, or maybe the second summer that I lived here, I wrote, uh, I read an article in the San Francisco Chronicle that Patricia Unterman had written on slow food. Yeah. And slow food, as you know, yeah. um, was started in Italy when they were building a McDonald's at the base of the Spanish Steps. And it was the Italians getting together and say, absolutely not. We do not want you to export that culture. We want to honor local food traditions uh, and keep those alive. And Alice Waters, chairman of the board of Slow Food in the US. And so I read about it. I joined the Marin County chapter. I was living in Sausalito and I ultimately ended up becoming the leader of the chapter and did that for eight years. And through that, I, I really built up a community with the cheesemakers, with the oyster farmers at Hog Island, with the winemakers, with, and I just have such admiration for these people. They're following their passion and it inspires me. I mean, there are people generations long. Yes. And if you spend time in the Napa Valley, you know, you, you find people are growing grapes, you know, they're grape farmers. They're, they're people who love the land and they're conservationists by nature. Um, but they're following their passion. They're handing it down to their children, those traditions. And I just have such admiration for them that it inspired me through Slow Food, I would organize events and we would bring the producers together um, with the consumers because it does cost more to produce things in this way rather than mass produced food and drink and all the, the degradation of the environment, yeah. the, the way you treat your workers, it's just a whole different thing. It costs more money. But I think if you tell the story of everything that's behind the food, then the consumers will also feel drawn to it. They'll reach for that product on the shelf instead of just the cheapest. Mm -hmm. um, that's essential what you it is. outlining right now. It, it really, but, but without hearing the story, they don't, they, they can't really picture why would I pay this much for a cheese or this much for a wine. And do you think people are really evolving in that understanding of the farm, the making, the slow time it takes, the involvement, the investment, hence the price. Um, I think some people get it. I yes. think we have a lot more work to be done. And I think the problem in this country in particular is that the government subsidizes. It's not that good food is more expensive. It's that bad food is so cheap. That's it. And it's because the government is subsidizing corn production, soybean. They're, they're subsidizing all of this cheap food. The hog farmer who is, we can't even go there on, on the conditions that the animals are being raised in. And if the true cost of food um, includes all that, the, the cost to the land, the yes. cost to the worker, health care. I mean, COVID, another silver lining is that you realize that you can't just expect people to go to work and not give them health care because if they're not well, they're going to infect your food and then it will trickle down. To That's you. right. So everyone needs to be taken care of. Make sure that everyone is healthy, but it's still a struggle. And mm -hmm. a lot of people like when you go to the farmer's market here, even when you go to a grocery store, like Whole Foods used to be. I'm not a huge fan these mm -hmm. days, I'll mm -hmm. say. But the, go to the farmer's market where things are not inexpensive and you don't see just the wealthiest people there. You see people for whom food, what they feed themselves, yeah. what they feed their families is their priority. Well, as it should be, right? Tell me what you eat, I'll tell you who you are. Yes. Uh, Bria Savarin had it all figured out already in the 19th century. Absolutely. So you think the trend though is, is there a big transformation on organic and biodynamic food now in, in America or in California at large? In California, certainly. Um, the, the coast are sort of on the forefront of that movement. New yes. England has um, been in it. California, Oregon um, has its own organic certification movement. And 
then you get into like the big food that has decided that organic is the thing. It can be organic, but grown in China. Yeah. No, thank you. I don't, you know, it's like you, you really have to pay attention to That's your food. Right. And we're lucky in, especially in Northern California, that we don't have to choose local over organic. You can get both. But people here have been educated that good food does cost more. I mean, when you see a big gulp at 7-Eleven, and I, I was just... I did go back east this summer and I rode by and 7-Eleven, it says any size drink for 99 cents. And one of their size drinks is this big, like nobody needs that. But if you're looking for, you know, value, yeah. then you might say, oh, I'm going to have that. And then you drink it all. And it's Change the prism. Slope. Yeah. So wh where are the makers evolving in general? You deal today, you started the magazine. It's a big success, obviously, and you're dealing with all those great local producers. Are they themselves realizing that organic, as an example, or slow food, sustainable organic is the direction? They are. I mean, if you're a dairy producer, like the conventional dairies mm -hmm. are losing money now. It's the value add of going organic yes that it costs more to produce but you also get a premium in the marketplace and that's what i, I was listening on public radio yesterday to an interview with lisa gotrich who yeah. has bohemian creamery and you probably sell it at oakville we grocery do. that's one of the best creamery I think, in california it, she's so special and unique yeah. and she's talking about covid so much of her business was to the restaurants and she's had to pivot and mm -hmm. now looking at grocers looking at selling direct and just the the trickle down of that is the there was a, a hispanic man who had his goat herd and bought his own property but you're you're supporting it um the whole ecosystem i mean the reason why northern california is so green it's because people are growing and making money off the land by growing yeah. things. Otherwise, you could just put up a bunch of tract housing here. But we have to make it viable for, sure. for them. But I think that what Lisa was saying is, is you have to make, you have to have a value, you have to make a cheese out of your dairy yeah. milk. Um, so transform the raw materials in yes. essence. Would it be milk, cream? Or tomato. or tomato, make it into salsa, make it into yeah. sauce. That's what like Star Out Farm, that was the first certified organic farm, I think west of the Mississippi. Really? And Warren Weber, who's very iconic out in Bolinas. Um, University of San Francisco has bought the Star Out Farm oh. farm and um, the beautiful farmhouse there. But they want to teach the business of farming. I love it. Because you can teach everybody how to grow a carrot, but if they can't market it and make a go of it, it doesn't make sense. So I think it's it's a struggle for this is I started um, during the first few weeks of COVID a new venture called Bay Area Doorstep. I want to toast to this. Let's toast to that. Yes, we got to go French this wines. This is now. gorgeous. We got to go to Bouchard, the mm. oldest one of the oldest Burgundy house, seventeen fifty. Yeah to toast for your new venture thank you because this is a big deal you know you see a true entrepreneur pre-covid but even covid happens she goes for it and i love that in you thank because you. this is a brilliant idea so thank you. as we toast yes. the sound of crystals dear friends only <laughs> only for gibson thomas mm. you know only crystal mm. the energy being passed on here is vibrational mm -hmm. too Mmm. Mmm. That's really wonderful. Really wonderful. So tell me about this. Well, that's a Puy Fusé. Mm -hmm. So this is really next to the famous town of Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. So in the 15th century, more or less, in Burgundy, southern Burgundy, there's a beautiful town in Puy Fusé. There's a town in Macon. In between those two, a great village named Chardonnay. And this is where Chardonnay started. So this is a Chardonnay from Burgundy. And you could see... Little amount of oak, the idea is to make it very, the term I use, vibrational, mm -hmm. very crisp, very fresh, very Chardonnay, without too much 
oakiness. Right. So it goes very well with vegetarian cuisine. It goes very well with spicy food. Mm -hmm. It goes very well with seafood or poultry. So Puy Fusse is kind of the iconic Southern Burgundy, you know, not crazy price, $20, $25 a bottle. Wow, and that's very reasonable. Very reasonable. Mm -hmm. But, but to this, your... This glass, I have to say, I need to start lifting It's a waist. chalice. It's very religious. <laughs> it's gorgeous. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, you start in the marketplace. So, um... In February. In... When did it... I launched in April. Wow. So, what a friend of mine in Marin... Um, moved, retired to the Hudson Valley mm -hmm. in New York and ended up taking over the my sister Edible publication, Edible Hudson Valley. Yeah. And so during COVID, even though they're retired, um, they decided to open, uh, to start an online marketplace for makers in the Hudson Valley. Brilliant idea. It really... It, it was something that the edible community of publications, there are like a hundred edible magazines across the country yeah. now, but we've never had a way, you can read the stories of the makers in the magazine and we have a digital version too, but there was no way to like, okay, I, I want to bring this. that to my house. I agree. And I've wanted, we've had this discussion before, you know, you look at you still you want it you look at one of those you want them absolutely so that's the way to do it now so now we um so they started what they called hudson river doorstep market and they did a beta they they put up a website it was very simple and easy relatively to put up the website and after like a two-week beta they had gotten such great feedback both from the makers who were so grateful for this lifeline for sure and for from the consumers that they called me because we're friends and they're like we're doing this marketplace they showed it to me online it was so beautiful i didn't hesitate and i said absolutely count me in i'll do one bay area doorstep market yes so i have the territory i have actually from the top of Cal of California down through Monterey. That's wonderful. So it's open to any makers. It's not just food and drink. We have apparel. We have a ceramic. Do you have wine? Yes, we what? have wine. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I got a toast to this too. <laughs> Another wonderful opportunity to do food and wine pairing. Yes, it really. It's a great. So it's a marketplace. People go on it. Yes. And they find. From the great article they've read, the actual purveyor. Yes, and they can search. It's like people have heard of Etsy. Mm -hmm. Etsy's not curated. What the difference between this marketplace and there's already so there's Hudson River doorstep market, New England doorstep market. Yes. Uh, that's in the New England state, started a couple of weeks after I did. Southland, uh, in the southern part of California, is just being built right now. I mean, we are building this as we fly it um, and launching on version two of our platform on the uh, autumnal equinox on September 22nd. Very important to yes. think of equinox as the perfect time to release We felt like release it, too. And something new. Get ready for... The new season and the holidays and shopping, but the Southland doorstep market is being built by a chef whose name is Ben Ford, and mm -hmm. then I found out his uh, father is Harrison Ford, which Ooh. is extra exciting. Ben used to be in the Bay Area, and now he's in LA. So we'll have the four markets, and we're looking at opening markets all across the country but that's what, very exciting what what for me like hog island oyster that's been a long time partner and supporter of the magazine um they have a restaurant in san francisco they have the farm in marshall mm -hmm. they have an oxbow public market yep. in napa they have the restaurant they had just opened one in the run country mart covid shut all of those down yeah so hog island used to ship oysters anywhere in the country twice a year at the holidays. They had two dates. Well, they had to figure out what to do with all of their oysters. So they, we do not ship. The marketplace is just a listing That's site. Right. We do not charge any makers to be on the site. We take a small commission and with just for sales. But now like Hog Island has gotten up and running. 
they are shipping every day. They're shipping mussels and oysters. They're shipping their craft cocktails. This is great. It is. So in addition to wine and beer and cider, there's an emergency order. Thank you to have a Governor Newsom who's in the food and drink business. There's an emergency order that even distillers can sell direct to consumers That's right amazing. now. Yeah. I'm hoping we never go back to the dark ages and the ABC laws after COVID, but they can... Which date back from prohibition time. Yes. Which is unreal as the evolution of the United States is so fast and mm -hmm. so amazing mm -hmm. to see the, the power of the distributors. But yeah, exactly. Back mm -hmm. to the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is a big evolution. Now, when you look at the producer, tell me about your views of the consumers in general, families. Are they consuming more at home, of course? Do you think it's about to stay? Do you think people want to receive more at home? What's the sociological evolution that you see in America at large? I, I believe we see so many restaurants failing. Um, it just wasn't sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the service industry and the way tipping was happening and you see a big move in the restaurants to change their whole paradigm. Yep. Yes. And I believe, you know, we love restaurants as a place to gather. Yes. And I don't think and I hope that won't go away. I think people need to understand the true cost of dining out. I mean, the margins are so thin, thin um, that we need to respect the, the workers, the restaurant owners, the, the producers that sell their wares to the restaurant. So I think that we need to um, understand the true cost and be willing to pay that. But I do think that people were forced to start cooking at home and entertaining small groups yes. at home. I have a big deck in Mill Valley and we're able to have, you know, people if we had two couples over um, last weekend. And it really is, it, I think it's ushered in a new era of people feeling more comfortable Great. with that. Well, I'm delighted to hear that because as we've discussed together before, coming from Europe, come to the house. And you don't overly complicate it. You cook what's available from the market. You put something together. And it's not about being judged on the food you prepare. You're not trying to be a three-star Michelin. You want just people to get together. And I hope, you know, we see that with wine. People coming home and opening a bottle and yes. starting cooking and calling friends and say, just come over and enjoy. And I'm, I'm excited about this because I've always personally noticed a little bit of a fear and maybe because I'm from France and people assume that I know food more than than most, which is probably not the case, but a little resistance to do that. And these days, more and more, I see people saying, are we in the kitchen? We're doing this. Right. Come over. Right. Or let's talk about this or tell me about this wine. And, and I'm excited. So do you think it's a big shift that we're going to see being imprinted in American society. I, I feel like, and I've read articles about sort of how the hubris of all the, the fashion houses, and they were coming out with six collections a year. And, you know, we have mutual friends probably that felt like they had to have the latest and the greatest. And COVID has just shut all that down. Yeah. People are not going out and getting their hair blown out. Um, every moment or making sure their manicure is perfect. Don't look too closely over here at mine. But I think there's just an authenticity that we've all been brought down yes. by this, you know, invisible enemy, this pandemic. And so it's it's been a little bit of a level set. Mm -hmm. And I think hopefully there will be less of an expectation to that has to be perfect that you can't have people over unless it's perfect yep. unless you unless your house looks perfect unless you look perfect unless you have the perfect meal and you know our mutual friends who are chefs like Tyler and Tolan and Florence people are like you cook for Tyler and like oh my god he's so happy if you throw together a grilled cheese That's that right. he's not cooking for himself mm -hmm. like he's so happy and I think that just to bring someone to your home just the feeling of that, the the camaraderie, and 
to get them in the kitchen. I'm lucky enough, I have a Southern Supper Club that uh, gets together once a month. I love it. It's really, it's really, really fun. It's always a potluck, it's not Southern food. Um, and it's it's crazy of there, I'd say there are 10 couples, maybe 12 in the Southern Supper Club and we get together once a month, which is great because then if you can't make it, it's not like once a quarter or something. So mm -hmm. if you can't make it, it's okay. You'll see the people the following month. But there's so many cooks in That's the group because right. in the South, you really grew up you cooking. Know, cooking. Um, but I also have a cookbook club, and I would encourage mm. people. That's a great idea. Um, in fact, Tara and Brian Meehan, mm -hmm. um, our friends, were For in sure. our, our cookbook club. And the idea is that is once a quarter. So whoever's hosting picks out a cookbook, and then you tell everybody what the cookbook is, and everyone in the group gets it. And you look through the cookbook, which I read like novels anyway, and decide what you want to cook. And then you all come together and That's you do right. as much as you. It is so much fun. For sure. It's just it, it, cooking as an as an activity is is really. Um, and you travel through cooking. Yes. A great deal. You discover civilization, cultures, foreign lands. We've done, like we did Charles Fan's uh, Vietnamese yes. cooking at home. And I loved it, by the way. Oh, it's terrific. I was very impressed with it. Our first cookbook was uh, Murad Lalo's New Moroccan. Sure. And um, he's a friend who lives in Sausalito. And just to go to those markets and to pick out those spices and to really like actually red boat fish sauce when we did charles fans cooking at home I remember going in the city and looking for red boat fish sauce and now it's on bay area doorstep market you can have it there we go. Your house. well but this is so exciting so you really believe um besides the negative effect the positive effect is a transformation of american society and do you think it will remain for a long time do you think the time has been so long now that there's a true transformation to it. Well, I, I believe that you can't unlearn what you've learned in this. And there might have been people that were making accommodations thinking, oh, I'll be in the house for two or three weeks, or, and then it became two or three months, and now yeah. it's, it's longer. So I do think that it's going to be a real lasting change that has happened. Um, for the better, uh, I have to believe something good of is going to come of this. And I, I have a, a one child who is a senior in high school this year, and I have to say it's really you know disheartening for him, starting school online, finishing his junior year online. He's a lacrosse lover, and we mm. lost a lot of um, lacrosse time over the summer and applying to colleges. But I feel like there's a resiliency that all of us are building and in particular um, I mean I, re I remember being worried about you know the Soviet Union when I was growing up and sheltering under um, we would have drills in elementary school but this generation hasn't had anything like that and it's, it's definitely brought us together in the parts that haven't split us apart and, and right. I think hopefully it'll make us stronger do you believe in destiny do you believe in fate? Not exactly the same. I, I do believe in fate. I believe things happen for a reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can feel that in you. So do you believe you were meant, you were sent with a mission to do this? I, the, the way things flow, like I knew nothing about publishing a magazine, obviously, and the way it comes together, and some of our issues have themes, and the themes, the way, the way those stories come, to me, it just, you know that you're doing the right thing yeah. and that you're on the right track when it all flows. And very often, I just say, so many serendipitous things happen around this magazine that I feel like I'm, yeah. I'm doing the Lord's work, as they say. Well, and Gibson <laughs> is doing it very successfully. I'm going to ask you to be successful to finish your glass of wine. Oh. So we could go to the next organic wine because you love... I do. The well, Russian River. Do you think you can manage let, I, I can manage you gonna need that. But help? I wanted to ask you a question about the temperature because I've noticed a trend in restaurants where whites aren't quite as cold That's right. as they used to be, which I really appreciate. Like, this is a great temperature. And then reds 
or people are chilling a little. So why not take a sip? Tell well, us absolutely. So what is so exciting is wine has a lot of aroma from your nose to as much as when you taste it. Retrofaction is basically smelling the wine through the back end of your mouth and you're still smelling. The body has a million pores through the skin that smell, that are sensories. And I think for wine, if you brutalize the wine by a cold temperature, you cannot smell anything. Mm -hmm. It's only smelling or have a bouquet mm -hmm. when it warms up or when you warm it up. So you want to avoid even the warming of a wine because it shows on you of not being able to serve it at the right temperature. So white wines are often served too cold. Mm -hmm. And you want to feel the wine. Wine is a fruit. Wine is a human being. Wine is like us. We're warming up to our stories. We're warming up to our discussions. Not that we do Good need job. that because we came warm into it. But you know what I mean. And wine is a companion. Wine is a friend. So I really believe temperature has to be room. My mother, you talked about your grandmother. My mother who is watching because she watches every day. Hello. <laughs> she always had me four hours before serving a dinner, which would in France be later, 7.30, p.m., mm -hmm. probably four o'clock, bring the wine to the room, bring your friend to temperature. Jean-Charles, the wine needs to rise to the temperature of the room. We have the same level, not exactly the same level as the body temperature, mm -hmm. which is 94, 95, mm -hmm. but a reasonable temperature so it's not too cold mm -hmm. so it's not from the cellar so it opens up to the appreciation of all of us as a friend in the room so i think gibson thank you for noticing we want to make sure specifically when our guests are with us live so close by that it's perfection yes so okay. how is it to be a woman entrepreneur in the publishing business like you've been and now in the marketplace because Many of our friends watching, you know, are thinking today, what do I do? Do I start a business? Do I go on my own? Do I become my own entrepreneur? What advice do you have? And what, what's your experience on that? Because it's a big deal. It's, it's a big deal to say I'm going to do it. It is. It can be, it can be scary. Um, and to think I'm not just going to draw a salary working for yeah. someone else. Um, for me, I kept thinking when I was still practicing law, and um, but I was falling in love with all the producers through Slow Food, what can I do to turn my passion into a vocation? I'm so glad. About and I think that's, I really think that is the difference, that it flows. And I frankly, I have quite a few women friends as their children are becoming less dependent as we are looking towards becoming empty nesters, I feel for them because I feel so grateful and fortunate to have found my passion and to, to make it work. And I think, you know, the hardest part of my job, it's a free magazine. Yeah. Um, I rely on advertising partners for and sure. like to have to sell an ad what I, decided when I started the magazine was I was going to make the best magazine I could and then there would be people who would want to be a part of it and luckily that's the case most of my advertisers have been with me for since the beginning and they stick with me because they feel my passion for these producers and I think if you care about what you do sorry to my friends who are not doing what they love certainly being but they a may thanks to your inspiration they may and it really does I think one of the things that another silver lining is going to be sort of work from anywhere yes and um, work from anywhere do anything you you can sell something across the country on these doorstep markets you can you can make a market wherever you are and so live where you want to live live in some place that really speaks to you and um yeah follow, uh, one of the things that that'll be is like how much money do you need that's right um if i and work backwards from there absolutely rather than always being in search of more 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 mm -hmm. In many ways, what for? Mm -hmm. I mean, this this work feeds my soul so much more, and yeah. I'm proud of it. And uh, I can 
you know, I'm proud of it when I talk to my son and I tell him the same thing. He says he wants to be an environmental lawyer and he's been doing environmental restoration work this summer, but that is the most important thing. If some people are drawn to work on Wall Street and I'm I'm glad they are. I appreciate yeah. those people. But um, the luxury of figuring out what you really love is a real gift. Well, I'm going to toast to that because you exactly summarized the theme of JCB Live is Let's Talk Passion. Mm -hmm. Because we started this wonderful discussion the day COVID hit. We said, we know where it's going to go. <laughs> We've lived those moments throughout history from 1918 to many times before. We got to talk about our passion. It should be yes. the time where people think about recalibrating, as you said, and focusing on priorities. Mm -hmm. Now, where do you see the future on that? As far as food and the world you live in, I mean, mm -hmm. not COVID, of course, but you know, the world of food at large, where, where is the big evolution taking us? Besides oh, the next issue, which we will is discover. This is wonderful. Organic, mm -hmm. Zinfandel, really the true history of the Russian River. So the whole idea here is cool climate Zinfandel. Not overly ripe, not too alcoholic, very gentle, very seductive. I'm a Zin girl. The American But, but they've kind of gotten too, too, too syrupy, too sweet, too. This is so drinkable and delicious. I'm less Thank of a you. Pinot fan, except I like that sparkling. But this Thank you. It's really well, wonderful. Well, I'm delighted. Well, and we sell in food too, as I'm sure you're the expert. You know, this goes phenomenally well. Yeah, fried With chicken. A, oof, we love it. <laughs> so I know I asked you a big question, but I think it would be fascinating for you as a phenomenal leader in the world of food and influencing food and influencing the craftsman, the artisan and the consumer. What's your, what's your view in that specific area in the future? I feel like that this has given us an opportunity just to be more conscious yeah. in everything. And there are some days where we feel, I feel, totally scattered and I can't concentrate and I have to bring it down to, some days I meditate, often I, I don't, Great. but just a consciousness in everything. And I think what we put in our bodies to be conscious of that, I mean, I believe food is medicine and mm. we're directly related like you can think oh i'm gonna eat that thing that would be so bad bad for me and you feel terrible after you eat it but when you really are consuming things that i mean think about something that's so volatile you're putting it in your body yeah it needs to be created with care it needs not to have the chemicals with the right intentions absolutely it it matters so much and that consciousness i think um if probably we could all just have a pill and eat and it would give us whatever sustenance <laughs> we need i hope we don't get there oh. I mean, how boring. I hear that Terrible. some pills are doing good things. <laughs> As I turn 50, not too long ago. I think if you eat and drink well enough, you don't need that little blue pill. Good. Well, <laughs> it hasn't been a necessity so far, but you know. But it, it really, um, it's an opportunity just for the small things yes. to appreciate. And we all eat, so why not use that? Um, to, to share with mm -hmm. each other, to like, to show your friends and your family love through food. It's a really easy and powerful right. thing to do. And I don't think we're gonna get to, um, I, I went to an event a couple of years ago and Jeff Bezos was talking about how, you know, the earth was gonna be destroyed and we should all go to Mars. And I thought, oh my God, and they're gonna do test tube babies and everybody could take a pill because we can't grow food on Mars. And I thought, can we just fix the earth? Like, what about the soil? What about, can Thank we just you. get well, back to the soil? <laughs> absolutely, why escaping that beautiful star we live on? Let's stay here. Yeah. No, but it, thank you for saying that. Now, what is your dream, mm. Gibson? You have so many. I want to hear one of them. I think my I, I'm my dream is really to create a place where 
Um, you've probably been to Bastille de Moustier. Mm -hmm. uh, that is Alain Ducasse's place in the south of France. I've yes. been there twice. I stumbled upon it one night um, when I was staying in uh, Monaco and drove up through Provence and, yeah. and stumbled upon it and went back the following year. And like, I feel like my destiny is to have a place where not just friends and family that maybe I'll I will have a place that I can welcome guests to there's mm. a wonderful place called Blackberry Farm mm -hmm. um, outside of Knoxville Tennessee that um, Sam Bell who's no longer with us who had spent time um, out here working for Cowgirl Creamery and he created and it's an educational space yeah. and they have a farm and they do a lot of a lot of wine for people sure from here go there but I can see myself as at the hostess I would love like that. that would you do that in the south or in Northern California which I'm praying you say Northern California so I could be there all the time yeah I uh, there there are a couple of projects people who have approached me during COVID actually yeah. about possibly partnering with them on creating that wow. here I mean I feel a little bit drawn to go back to the south because I feel like um, people who have left and can come back to the south have a lot to offer to the south but i don't know i say that and then i go there and i'm like oh no i have to stay here <laughs> well what about doing both <laughs> i could i would toast to both mm, thank you no but that would be exciting and i i i love how you really inspire us uh one to follow our passion to be inspired by history in the past and and to bring consciousness at large into everything we touch whether it's the food we intake to to everything else i mean i love your way of thinking so you so wise oh. in many ways and wild in others <laughs> which makes those red hair so exciting dear friends what would you send as a message to everybody with us listening within any areas you want to address hmm. Well, I know it's a big question. No, that is a big question. You, your you editorial is always phenomenal, and this is the first thing I read. And often we don't spend enough time in magazines reading the editor's message, and I think we should all spend more time doing that. And and I love so much what we do, what you do, and I'm such a big believer. It doesn't have to be related to this, but in general, I mean, we've lived the most transformative time in our lifetime. Yeah. Luckily, it was not a war, you know, because it would have been more tragic, yes. for sure. Mm -hmm. But what do you want to leave us with today? The wisdom of Gibson <sighs> Thomas. Wow, this is a big moment, John Charles. I, I would say I've been um, uh, really thinking a lot lately about this concept of self-care. Yeah. And self-care, for me, part of that is also taking care of other people, like my friends, my family, like I really get so much back. Yes. Um, and I say like the magazine is a gift to me, like producing the magazine gives me so much. But I really think that just being conscious at every moment, so we can't travel all over the world right now, you can make just the time with your family and friends and be reaching out to people and i guess it's a message is it's just about connecting yes with people like really truly connecting with people i do that through gathering them together um food but even if it's picking up the phone and and calling people that you can't see right now it's so enriching and i I have found that I don't have to have the the latest fashion. Like I look at my sort of summer clothes um, sitting in the bin that really didn't get a lot, a lot of use this summer. Yeah. And it's okay. That's right. It's such a fantastic statement. Thank you so much. And it's so encouraging to see great leaders like yourself, entrepreneurs, mother, you know, who did not hesitate to cross the United States to build a new life and to make it so successfully and to inspire others. So, thank Gibson, you for having me. thank you so much. It was phenomenal. Dear friends, you know, you could feel it through the energy 
we could go on for many more hours. Maybe we'll have a few more episodes together, Gibson. <laughs> we'll just take the show on the road. Let's go to France. Oh, we ready. <laughs> so remember, at Evil Magazine, there's a hundred of them around the country. Yes. But there's only one. Exactly. Who is the most amazing in Northern California. <laughs> Even if you're not in Northern California, I know many of you are not, we could probably ship it to you. So find it online, look for your local edible. And, and shop on Bay Area Doorstep Market for Oakville Grocery. And you've got to get your wines on there. Absolutely. <laughs> Soon our wines. Gibson, thank you for being with us. Thank you. And dear friends, see you tomorrow. <laughs>